Hi everyone, welcome to Knee and Popliteal Fossa. So a big thing to note during all of these online lectures is I want you to take your time with this. I want you to break it up. I want you to get some rest when things seem like they're getting a little confusing. I definitely want you to try to understand this material as much as possible. So really and truly the key is small chunks. This is going to be very very different than our normal lectures and the fact that you're going to get a ton of content in these PowerPoint slides and then in the Blackboard Collaborate sessions we're actually going to get into more of the application, more of the palpation, more of the lab skills if you will. So when we're talking about the knee joint itself really what we're talking about here are two different joints. We're talking about the tibial femoral joint and we're also talking about the patellofemoral joint. So tibial femoral again, and I've said it a hundred thousand times in class, says what it is, is what it says. That is the interface between the femoral condyles and the tibial plateaus or the condyles. What our knee is really doing is it's really weight bearing. So the tibial femoral joint is going to be that weight bearing portion of the knee joint. Now the patellofemoral joint, that's going to be more based on the interface between our patella and the femur. Now again, says what it is, is what it says. If you guys can notice, I did not call this the patella tibial joint. I called it the patella femoral joint. The reason is because the patella and the femur are going to interface with one another. And what we're going to see is we're going to see that patella track or move as the knee is flexing and extending. And that's exactly what the function of the patella is. It is it's going to reduce a little bit of friction to decrease tendon wear so that patella ligament and patella tendon don't get shear forces placed through them. And it's also going to provide an anatomic pulley for the quadriceps muscle. So looking at the articulating surfaces of the knee, really what we need to be aware of here is we need to be aware of the medial and lateral femoral condyles. Now you look at the medial and lateral femoral condyles here, we notice a couple things. One is that lateral femoral condyle, much shorter, much more circular in nature. We look at the medial femoral condyle, it's much more oblong. Now that's going to be a very important concept when we start moving into concepts like medial and lateral rotation at the tibia those medial and lateral femoral condyles and medial and lateral tibial condyles are really what's going to drive that rotation when we flex and extend our knee joint. Other big thing to note here is take a look at that shape of the patella. That patella grooves into that femur and really does aid with that tracking. So what we're going to do here is we're going to watch a little video of the different pieces and parts of the patellofemoral joint and the tibiofemoral joint. So as we go through this, start looking at the pieces and parts here. Okay, start looking at the femur, start understanding the parts of the femur. Understand that patellar groove, medial and lateral femoral condyles as well. Also understand the tibial condyles. So a big thing I want you to note here is exactly where those structures are. Obviously we just point to the patella there. I'm pulling patella off at this section. And then take a look at the convex surfaces, that groove, that intercondylar groove. Take a look at the tubercles. Obviously, there's tuber tuberosity right there. And get a good appreciation for how that joint acts on a convex surface and on a concave surface. Looking at this slide, and please excuse the horrible, horrible drawing here. But what I'm really trying to represent is the difference in size between the lateral epicondyle and the medial epicondyle. Take a look at those. That lateral epicondyle is going to be the smaller circular drawing. The medial epicondyle is going to be the larger, more ovular drawing. Obviously, I also have drawn in where the patella should be. Obviously, we're not looking at a patella here that's been attached. I have detached the patella. So let's just make sure we know those pieces and parts understand how the arthrokinematics really do mimic the osteology. The osteology really does 
force or influence the Arthur kinematic. So understand that relationship between those two. Also understand how that patella is going to track. Understand it's going to track in the femur. It's not necessarily going to track on top of the tibia. Reason being is that we have a large groove on that femur, not the tibia. Now taking a look at the tibia here, also understand the difference between the lateral, which is up towards the top of the screen, and the medial tibial condyles. Tibial condyle, the medial one, is down towards the bottom of the screen. Look at those. Look at the size between those structures because that, again, will dictate arthrokinematics. So definitely make sure you understand that. Also understand the intracondylar notches and understand where those ligaments are going to attach in that section. So here's the importance of the patella. Really need to make sure we know what the patella is all about. Really need to make sure we know why we have a patella. So in very short order, obviously when we're looking at our femur has our quadricep muscle, our tibia does not. When we're moving in the open chain, we're moving that tibia around the femur. Now remember, when we're looking at these surfaces, need to make sure that we're aware of which surface is convex and which surface is concave. Now the advantage that our patella gives is obviously it provides a very large pulley system. So it provides a larger angle, if you will, as opposed to what a non-patella system would provide. So when someone has their patella removed, like for example, I had a patient whose patella was blown off with a shotgun here about you know, 10 to 12 years ago. He lost about half of his quadricep strength. And literature validates that, that folks that have their patellas removed, either surgically, traumatically, or some people are just born without them. It's more of a congenital defect. They actually lose 40 to 49% of their quadriceps contraction ability. Now, taking a look at the proximal tibia, what we need to be aware of here is we really need to be aware of where that pes anserinus is. Remember that pes anserinus stands for goose foot? And it's going to be the junction between sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus. So really be comfortable with each of those muscles, where each of those muscles come from, their proximal and distal attachments. Also be very comfortable with how you would test those. So what we really need to think about is, how would I test sartorius? How would I test gracilis? How would I test semitendinosus? Then start thinking about what nerves innervate those. Start thinking about how your patient would present if they had problems there. Also, as we start to build on this information, think about what other structures could be there as well. A key structure that's going to lie in the same area as that pesanserinus is going to be the medial collateral ligament. So one thing you're really going to have to do as a physical therapist is differentiate, is my patient having pesanserinus pain or is it my patient having medial collateral ligament pain? So taking a look at how the knee joint, how the tibiofemoral joint, to be more accurate, is classified, this is a complex compound synovial joint. We have two condyles, so therefore it's bicondylar. Or you could say that there's two modified ovoids, okay, or two modified ovals. It functions primarily as a hinge joint, being flexion and extension. But because the medial and the lateral femoral condyles and the medial and lateral tibial condyles are not the same size, then we're going to have some transverse plane rotation. We're going to have a little bit of motion in the transverse plane. This is very important to note because patients are going to come in and they're going to have problems flexing or extending their knee. And a lot of times it's not because of what's happening with the hinge complex, it's what's happening with transverse plane rotation.
So ta taking a look at this video here, let's look at the Arthur kinematics that are happening. So there's my femur moving on my tibia. What I have here is I have a convex surface moving on a concave surface. So if I am flexing at the femur, therefore my femur is flexing on my tibia, posterior roll, anterior slide. If I have extension, I have an anterior roll, posterior slide. So pay attention to the arthrokinematics. Really start to think about what bone is moving on what bone in the open chain and what bone is moving on what bone in the closed chain. So if we are dealing with open chain knee flexion, knee extension, that will be the tibia moving on the femur. If we're dealing with closed chain knee extension, the femur will be moving on a fixed tibia. Now what we're looking at here obviously is the same bones again. We're looking at our tibiofemoral joint. Patella has been detached. So take a look at this. I want you to really understand those arthrokinematics because not only is this going to play into the arthrokinematics at the knee joint itself, but also the arthrokinematics at the hip joint and the ankle joint. Because what we're going to see is that femur obviously attaches both at our pelvis and at our tibiofemoral joint and our patellofemoral joint. And that tibia attaches at our tibiofemoral joint and honestly at our towel cruel joint as well. Now looking at this, this is mimicking that locking home and unlocking mechanism. So notice how that tibia moves. That tibia moves because we have a asymmetrical length between our medial and lateral femoral condyles. So make sure you understand that we're going to have some transverse, we're going to have some rotation that happens with knee flexion and knee extension. Again, spend some time with this. Do this on yourself. Do this on a partner. Do this on a family member. Really understand that knee flexion and knee extension, especially when we're dealing with the last 30 degrees of knee extension or the first 30 degrees of knee flexion, is not a one-plane motion. It is a two-plane motion. So when we look at the patellofemoral joint, it is a compound synovial joint. Okay, so technically it's a facet joint or a modified ova joint. And what we have really with the patella is that it's going to track in the femoral groove or in that patella groove. So basically what happens is that as, and we're going to do a little bit of lab on this as well, as I'm flexing and extending my knee, my patella does not stay stationary it's going to slide or it's going to track based on how my knee is moving. If I flex my knee, my patella will track distally or inferiorly. If I extend my knee, my patella is going to track superiorly. So stability of the knee. Knee is one of the strongest joints we have the stability we get is from the four ligaments that we have those being the anterior cruciate ligament posterior cruciate ligament medial collateral ligament lateral collateral ligament also on top of that we have menisci that sit and they actually act very similar to that the glenoid labrum did in the shoulder so menisci is going to offer some depth it's also going to offer a little bit of cupping and shock absorption to the tibial plateaus, the tibial condyles. And on top of this, we're going to have this big, large quadricep muscle, big, large hamstring muscles, the popliteus muscle. Those are all going to add stability as well. So we have all of these objects that offer all this stability. And I want you to be very familiar and very comfortable with how that happens. Now, taking a look at the picture here, Again, this is another one of my bad drawings. So not only do those medial and, tib and lateral tibial condyles have different shaped or different sized surfaces, but they also have different shaped and different size menisci. 
on the lateral side, what we're going to see is my meniscus is shaped much more like a C. That's going to add to that arthrokinematic that is already happening. My medial meniscus is going to be much more oblong and much more shallow than the lateral meniscus. Now taking a look at kind of a top-down axial look at the menisci, what can happen is we're going to have a much larger open area in the middle portion of that meniscus. On top of that, taking a look at the side view, and that's what you see at the bottom picture here, is you can really get a good appreciation for how much extra profile those menisci add to the tibial plateaus. So you really get a good idea here of how the femur sits down in and it's almost kind of cupped into the menisci. Also, and this is getting into a little bit of imaging, we have to know where the menisci are because we're going to have patients come in who have had MRIs done. And if you look at the three blue lines up in the upper right hand corner of the screen, that's kind of how an MRI is done. Okay, so an MRI takes multiple cross-sectional images. And if you think about it, if you don't know where you are in that cross-sectional image in terms of the anatomical placement, sometimes that meniscus can look torn. Because if you think about it, if you take a picture in the middle, you're going to see two portions of the meniscus. You won't see the entire meniscus. So just kind of want to note that, and just in case you take a look at an MRI, and you say, wait a minute, the, mid the middle of the meniscus is gone. More than likely what's happened is that they're taking a picture at that point in time of the medial portion of that meniscus. Now in terms of innervation, the horns and the periphery of those menisci are really highly vascularized and really highly innervated. So that's where you're going to have the, mo the majority of the blood supply. That's where you're going to have majority of nerves. Now, think about it. If something is a little more vascular, okay, it's going to be able to heal faster. It's also going to be a little more supple, okay, because it's going to have fluid flowing in and out of it. So a lot of times what we see is we see that the medial portions of the meniscus can be torn due to poor vascularization, also due to increased weight bearing as well from the femur and the tibia. So that's just kind of more of a nice to know thing, but just kind of realize where the majority of that innervation is happening when it comes to menisci, it's actually coming from the outer edges. So this is our knee joint capsule. So knee joint capsule, and you guys have kind of cut through this already in Cadaver Lab, it's a double layer capsule of fibrous tissue. And it literally engulfs or envelops the entire knee joint and everything else around it. Now in looking at this drawing, this is obviously another one of my terrible drawings. What I'm really trying to get across here is the difference between an intracapsular ligament and an extracapsular ligament. Now, the red circle is the capsule. What I'm looking at here is that my LCL or lateral collateral ligament is an extra, uh, extra capsular ligament. My medial collateral ligament is an extra capsular ligament. But ACL and PCL are both intracapsular. So it's very important to know the difference between those. Very important to know what structures are within the capsule and what structures are outside of that fibrous capsule. So taking a look at the fibrous capsule again, please be aware that, that fibrous capsule blends with the patella retinaculum and the IT band. So when that patient comes in and I have IT band pain, think about not only the IT band and tensor fascia lata as being a source of pain, also start thinking about the fibrous capsule as well. Think about that fibrous capsule as being an actual thing, not just something we cut through to get down to an ACL, but it is a source of pain. It does have continuous and subcutaneous innervation, so it can be a source of a lot of pathology. 
Now obviously looking at this picture, we're looking at a, a picture of a cadaver. This really is to give you a sense of what that fibrous capsule looks like when it's on, so over that right hand side picture, versus when it's off, when it's been dissected. So what I really want you to get appreciation for here is how many structures envelop within that fibrous capsule. Now taking a look at capsule kinesiology, this is really, really important. Understand the difference between closed packed and loose packed position. Loose pack position is synonymous with open pack position. For the knee, closed pack position is going to be full extension and full external rotation. Very, very important to remember. The loose pack position is going to be around 20 to 30 degrees of knee flexion. So remember, that's where the capsule is going to be the loosest. And that's where we're going to test things like the ACL and the PCL and the MCL and the LCL. Look at the picture. When my knee's in full extension, the anterior portion of the capsule is loose, posterior portion is tight. When my knee's in flexion, anterior portion of the capsule is tight, posterior portion of the capsule is loose. When I'm in the middle, when I'm about 20 to 30 degrees, both the anterior and posterior portions of that capsule are equally loose. This is why it's such an ideal position to test ligament in. This gives me the best shot to get a true test on the ligament. If you think about it, if I try to test the ACL in full extension, then I'm going to get a false positive because one part of that capsule is going to be tight. Therefore, either give me a false positive or a false negative reading. This is just another picture of the synovial membrane. Again, very good to know. Understand that the synovial membrane anteriorly, the synovium adheres to the inner wall of the fibrous layer and to the inferior and superior outer margins of the menisci. So understand that. Understand that synovial membrane kind of attaches to the outer edge of that meniscus. But also understand that the synovial membrane is separated from the patellar ligament by the infrapatella fat pad. This is very important to know because you're going to have patients come into your clinic and they're going to get a diagnosis of knee pain. And you're going to have to be the one to figure out where their knee pain is coming from. Understand that sometimes it's coming from the fat pad, sometimes it's coming from, from the synovium, sometimes it's coming from meniscus, and be aware of how those are going to present and be aware that that fat pad is going to separate out from that synovium. So quick word here about communicating bursa and non-communicating bursa. So what a communicating bursa is, is a bursa that's basically a part of that synovial membrane. So when you hear the term communicating bursa, we really have to think, okay, that's part of the membrane. Obviously, a non-communicating bursa is not going to be part of the membrane. So what the general function is of a bursa is a little bit of lubrication, a little bit of nutrition, right? It's going to keep that joint moving, keep that joint flowing, both from a liquid standpoint and a nutrient standpoint. The two communicating bursa of the knee are going to be the supra patella bursa and the popliteal or popliteus bursa. So make sure you know those. Make sure you understand what is a communicating bursa and a non-communicating bursa. Non-communicating bursa. There's five of them here. I'm not going to read them to you. Obviously, you can read them yourself. Understand the difference. Understand that my non-communicating bursa are not part of that synovial membrane. So obviously, we're looking at ligament here. So let's look at the difference between the LCL and the MCL. Obviously, my LCL is going to be my lateral collateral ligament. My MCL is going to be my medial collateral ligament. What I want you to understand here is that when that valgus stress happens, 
my MCL is going to be stretched or is going to go under tensile force. And we can see that here. Obviously, you see what a rupture it looks like when I stretch it too much. Varus force is going to stretch that LCL. Now, easy way to remember this, um, which is LCL and MCL. LCL is going to attach to the fibular head. So obviously, my fibula is going to have to be on that side of the body. So make sure you understand what forces will stretch or provide a tensile force for the LCL and the MCL. This video is going to show you the function of the ACL. Now, be patient. Give me a second. Let me get it under the camera. There we go. As I anteriorly translate the tibia, and, or if I posteriorly translate the femur, the ACL is under stretch. When I flex the knee, though, no big deal. The ACL is not under a tensile force if I flex my knee. This video here in a second is going to show you more knee ligament. So again, just be aware of how that ligament moves. Be aware of how that ligament acts. What I want you to really start coming away with this is what motions provide tensile force for which ligament and which motions don't provide tensile force. Obviously when a ligament is under tensile forces it's going to rupture if it's pulled or pushed too far. Now what we're seeing here posterior translation of the tibia stretches my PCL. Posterior translation not so big of a deal of the femur. Anterior translation of the femur rips that PCL right off. So start making those correlations, start making those connections between the ligaments and each of the osteological motions. Screw home mechanism of the knee. I have a lot of supplement video on this one because I really want you to understand this point. Spend some time with this slide and spend some time with the next slide. Please do that. Close kinetic chain. Layman's term. My foot's on the ground. I'm in a weight-bearing position. I'm 30 degrees from full extension. Layman's term. Mini squat. What's going to happen when I go from the mini squat position up to standing is this. Remember back to the lateral and medial femoral condyles. Lateral femoral condyle is done with arthrokinematics. It's already gone through what it's going to go through. The medial femoral condyle continues because it's bigger. The result is internal rotation of the femur. This internal rotation of the femur will then bring the tibiofemoral joint back into a closed pack position. Now looking at the open chain, we're again, we're in a non-weight bearing position here. So open chain, non-weight bearing. I'm going to sit on something. My foot's going to be up in the air. And I'm about 30 degrees in flexion, or in other words, 30 degrees from full extension. I'm going to move from 30 degrees to full extension. Here's what happens. My lateral tibial condyle, because it's smaller too, just like the femur, it completes its arthrokinematics first. As we continue to extend the medial tibial condyle, which is bigger, continues its roll and slide. The result is lateral rotation of the tibia. Please understand that. Please understand which part is moving on which part. Also, please understand which part is medially moving immediately rotating and which part is laterally rotating. This is a nice little chart. Again, pause the video, memorize this chart, 
understand which part is moving on which part. I'm going to have a couple videos here coming up that are going to highlight the closed chain and open chain locking and unlocking mechanisms. So make sure you understand it. My suggestion is do it on yourself, do it on a family member, and do it on a friend. All right, so we're dealing with open chain knee extension here. Watch what happens. Look at that tibia. As we move into extension, the tibia laterally or externally rotates. As we move into flexion, the tibia is going to medially rotate. So please understand that fact. I'm going to let this video run because I want you to watch it a few different times. Understand the tibia is the one moving. Understand that extension brings lateral rotation of the tibia. Flexion will bring medial rotation of the tibia in the open chain. This is an even better view because now we're looking at top down. Okay, so we can really get a good appreciation for how that tibia moves. Again, watch that tibia. You can see it move. You can see it laterally rotate. You can also, as it extends, you can also, as it flexes, see it medially rotate. So again, I'm going to let the video run, really get a good sense for how that motion occurs. Totally switching gears here. Now this is the vascular supply to the knee. It's pretty easy. Everything is named for where it is compared to the knee. So just understand that the femoral artery goes through the adductor hiatus, becomes the popliteal artery, and the superior lateral geniculate Geniculate just means knee. Genu just means knee. Things like genuflect means flex the knee. Superior lateral geniculate is the one that's superior in lateral. Superior medial geniculate is the one that's superior in medial. Obviously, the inferior medial and lateral geniculate follow the same type of path. I have a supplement video on this as well. Also understand that as we continue distally that the artery, the popliteal artery, will bifurcate, it will split into two, into the t anterior and posterior tibial arteries. So looking at innervation to the knee, what we really need to know here 
Again, this comes down to your compartments of the thigh. Go back to that thigh lecture and think about your compartments. Think about that cross section. So femoral nerve is going to hit or innervate the anterior compartment. Obturator nerve is going to innervate the medial compartment. And sciatic nerve is going to innervate the posterior compartment. As that sciatic nerve passes through the popliteal space, it's going to split into a tibial portion and then a common fibular portion. Now as we move down the chain, as we move down the body into the lower leg, we're going to notice that common fibular portion is then going to split into a superficial fibular art, uh, nerve and is a deep fibular nerve as well. So take a look at the anatomical relationships here. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on these slides because this should be a lot of review information. Just understand that the femoral nerve will terminate in the saphenous nerve. Okay, and that's going to become a cutaneous nerve that's going to innervate the deep fascia, the deep cruel fascia. As we know from tests and measures, that the L3 dermatome is the medial dermatome. Also look at the sciatic nerve, the tibial nerve, and common fibular nerve. Understand where all of those innervate. Obviously we just talked about this in terms of compartments. So just be aware of those compartments. Just be aware of where those nerves will innervate both from a motor standpoint and a sensory standpoint. So here's your dermatome patterns. Obviously, we see a big pattern that L3 is going to innervate the medial knee. We know that from tests and measures. Also, understand where your sciatic nerve innervates and your common fibular nerve innervates as it starts to split into the deep and superficial fibular nerves. So a lot of this should be review. Understand as well the different cutaneous nerves that you're going to test as a physical therapist. So a lot of times we're going to have patients who have either a peripheral nerve injury or another sort of injury, say like a back injury. From a motor perspective, these are your myotomes. Understand that L3, L4 is going to be your knee extension myotome. L5, S1 is going to be your knee flexion myotome. And then understand where your reflexes come from and understand that when we do a patellar reflex, we're actually going to test the L3 and L4 reflex. Now I have a supplement video of this of the popliteal fossa. Just understand the borders of the popliteal fossa. This is like any other anatomic space that we've talked about so far this semester. So definitely watch that supplement video. I actually draw everything out. So I want to make sure you guys really understand what's in that popliteal fossa and obviously how we border that and how we name everything.